All right, let's go ahead and get started. So this talk is called uh, Data Without Borders. It's about using Rook storage orchestration at a global scale. So my name is Jared Watts. I'm uh, one of the founders of the Rook project and a senior maintainer on it now. And I'm also a founding engineer at a Seattle-based startup called Upbounds, and we are hiring. So uh, let's just do, go quickly through some level setting here. So why might you want to deploy uh, your storage uh, systems globally? And you can also think about when you're deploying globally, uh, you may also be in a multi-cloud scenario or configuration as well. And so some reasons you might want to do that, there's a number of them, but one of the big ones definitely is reliability. So when you spread your data out across a number of data centers, regions, um, providers, all that sort of stuff, you're kind of hedging your bets against failures. Um, so it makes you more resilient towards uh, any one particular provider or region having a catastrophe. Uh, performance can be another reason as well. When you globally distribute your, da your data, if you're aware of where your users are that are consuming the data, you can put that data closer to them and decrease the amount of time that it takes for them to access that data and increase their performance. You know, cost is obviously a huge one as well, where um, you know, if, you're, if you're distributing yourself across the globe, you can make choices about uh, where you're running and choosing, you know, optimizing on cost. Um, innovation is interesting because uh, all the different cloud providers, they have some really good engineers, and they're consistently cranking out new features. I think Amazon, I don't know how many hundreds of services they have now, but um, you know, when you're able to run across all these different environments and providers, you can start taking advantage of new features that come from them. Uh, there's a number of other different reasons as well, uh, but you know, compliance is important too. Like perhaps you need to keep your data within one particular country or one particular uh, region, like the EU, um, and some other ones as well. But there's basically there's some reasons that you might want to run your, uh, your services or your storage globally or in multi-cloud scenarios. Uh, we can get through this pretty quickly, I think, because um, I'm pretty sure everyone here is fairly familiar with a lot of these concepts. Uh, but one thing that's important to note here, uh, a couple things, the difference between availability and durability. So availability is just resist resistance to a temporary downtime, like a data center goes offline. Uh, if you are highly available, then you've got that data available somewhere else, and your clients, uh, your consumers' requests can be fulfilled from another data center. So you didn't lose any of the availability that you have to service your customers. And durability is a little bit different, though, and that means resistance to total, complete, you know, permanent loss. Of you've got enough copies of the data that if you lose one, a hard drive or whatever, for forever, that you have another copy and it's still durable and the data you know, still exists. Um, locality is an interesting one that I wasn't really aware of before uh, starting in this space. And so locality is being aware of geographically where you're located. And you can start making decisions when you're aware of your locality about you know, uh, where, where you're located, where people are consuming your data, where you might want to move to in order to decrease the amount of latency for your, your uh, consumers. And then disaster recovery. Uh, did anyone see the, I'm sure people did, because there are a lot of people in the keynotes, but the spa, David Shaw from uh, Spotify talking about not how he destroyed one of his Kubernetes clusters, but it was multiple ones. Um, they had disaster recovery plans in place, so they were able to recover from that. So his clusters went boom, and they had an answer for now what? They recovered. It was, that was a pretty impressive talk, definitely. All right, so I'm, most people are probably familiar with the Rook project, but let's get through this quickly here of what is Rook. So Rook is a cloud-native storage orchestrator, and what that really means is that it extends Kubernetes with a bunch of custom types and custom controllers that do a lot of basically software automation for your storage systems. So all these different tasks like uh, bootstrapping the, your storage system, configuring it, managing it, keeping it healthy, monitoring it, all those different tasks um, you know, we provide a lot of software automation around those, these operational tasks, such that you know, normally humans do those, but we, the Rook project has built a number of orchestrators or operators that codify that domain expertise about how to run a distributed uh, complex software excuse me, storage system and put it into code to do it automatically for you. Uh, additionally, it's got this framework that can be used to build or support multiple storage systems. So we started with a single um, storage solution in the Rook project, and now I think we host uh, or support like six or seven with this framework that we've written. Um, and it is a CNCF project. We donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in January of 2018. And then in September of last year, we, um, we were moved to the incubation phase. And that's why we get to have a little flag and our logo all over the place here. I'm pretty ha happy about that. Um, so let's, make a, let's do, make a distinction here between control planes and data planes. 
So Rook, as a storage orchestrator, it's a control plane. It is not the data plane. Um, when you want to actually read or write bytes to your persistent storage, you're going through a data plane. You're going through the underlying storage provider. In contrast, Rook is more the control plane. So it does those operational tasks of deploying and bootstrapping and configuring and managing the data plane. But Rook itself does not, it's not on the data path. It is not the data plane. Um, therefore, that means an implication of that is that Rook can go offline for minutes at a time and not affect your availability of your data because it is the control plane, which is separate from the data plane. So there's multiple data planes that I was uh, speaking about that Rook performs these orchestration services for, and we're going to get into some deep dives on some of those there. But if uh, an analogy here, if you're familiar with uh, Istio and Envoy, is that that's the exact same relationship, where Istio is a control plane that manages and configures and sets up the Envoy proxies. And then Envoy just, all it does is worry about streaming bits around and routing traffic and handling the data. So Istio control plane, Envoy data plane, Rook control plane, and you know, EdgeFS, Ceph, uh, Cassandra, um, CockroachDB, et cetera, are data planes. So that's an important distinction to make because you can have different approaches to global scalability in your data plane and in your control plane. So let's first take a look at the data plane approaches. So in our data planes, uh, at a high level, there's basically two ty different types of architectures here. One is a storage system that is natively sort of designed and architected to work at a global scale from the very beginning. That's just part of its core architecture. So EdgeFS and CockroachDB are examples of that. And then you have, uh, in a different type of architecture, you have a storage system that works more at a local scale. That design and architecture is optimized for a single cluster. And then it, uh, in order to do global scalability or global scenarios, it, it works more like at a federation type of scenario, where it's, it's managing all its data locally, and then it'll federate with other clusters to replicate and mirror its data outwards. So all the examples that I'm about to give you here are from uh, data planes, storage systems, that Rook does orchestration control plane services for. So the first one is Ceph. So as I mentioned, Ceph was the very first storage system that Rook started doing orchestration for. Um, it's the most stable. It has the most contributors uh, in the Rook project. Uh, we declared it stable and production ready uh, in our uh, I don't know if it's 0.9 or 1.0, but version 1.0 is out as of a few weeks ago. And so Ceph is production ready and declared stable. So the, the key part here of Ceph's architecture is that it's, you know, as I mentioned, it's for a single local cluster uh, specifically. It's not designed to be natively a global storage system. So something that's really good about Ceph is that it has a very strongly consistent storage model. So when you are architected, to work within a single cluster, and you have you know, very close um, locality to the other nodes in the cluster, you have very small latency times, sub five millisecond latency times for, your, for the nodes there, you can start doing things that enable uh, high performance and strongly consistent data. So when you write a byte to the Ceph storage system, uh, it needs to replicate it, copy it out to other nodes and replicas in the system. And it does that synchronously. It will do uh, the writes to the other copies uh, of the, uh, the replicas in the system. And only until all of them have acknowledged that write will it commit and return back to the client saying that your data has been written, it's, it's committed, it's done. Um, so we can do this uh, because it's designed for a single cluster with low latency amongst all the nodes. Um, another really cool thing about the Ceph architecture is that it's uh, incredibly highly scalable because it decentralizes the choices about where to place data in the cluster. Independently, each client can make a decision about where the data is supposed to be located by following a consistent algorithm. So you don't have to go to a centralized bottleneck to say, where should I put this fragment? Where should I put this fragment? There's not this central uh, store that's authoritative where the data goes. Anybody could do it. It's an independent algorithm that each client can do on their own. Uh, so and to get to global scale, though, now really what the point of this talk is about is that this single cluster we have here, we can set up these federation scenarios where we're doing asynchronous replication, or in other words, you describe it as mirroring, where we're taking all the blocks or all the objects that are stored in the Ceph file system, and we're asynchron asynchronously replicating those out to other clusters. Um, we're not doing writes from the client perspective across all these different clusters. We are writing it to the local cluster, and then we're mirroring it out in a federated type of scenario. 
So that really you know, enables uh, scenarios of like, disaster recovery, high availability, and reliability uh, through that federated type of architecture. Now, EdgeFS, this is another storage system that Rook provides com control plane orchestration services for. And now this, uh, in contrast to Ceph, is a natively designed uh, system to be globally available. So EdgeFS's architecture is based on uh, immutable blocks, kind of similar to Git. And when I say Git, I don't mean a blockchain. I mean that blocks of data that make up files are immutable, and they have, uh, so a you make a modification to a block, and it's globally unique, and it's versioned, and that modification results in a whole brand new identity of the block. So this gives us some advantages in EdgeFS that caches on multiple sites that are making up this, this uh, globally distributed cluster are always in a consistent state, and that allows us to have global fault tolerance and global scalability. So the terminology used in EdgeFS is that it's segmented storage. So each site, um, you know, like let's say one in Asia, one in Europe, uh, one in North America, those can all be thought of as segments, and then they are stitched together into a single geo uh, namespace. And the uh, component inside of EdgeFS that does that is called an intersegment gateway. It's connecting all these segments together into a single namespace. So one of the, uh, when you have a globally distributed file, uh, excuse me, storage system, uh, some, you need to make some optimizations to be able to have clients have good performance still. So one of these optimizations that's particularly useful here is a metadata only mode. And so let's say we have one segment here uh, in Asia and one segment here in North America. And so you can enable this metadata only mode where what happens initially is that only the metadata, like uh, the file names, the file system structure, uh, timestamps, uh, file sizes, information like that, gets sent across to the other segments in the geo cluster there. And so that enables clients in other parts of the world to immediately see what files are there, what files they can read to, write to, make decisions about how they went in and want to interact with the storage system. And then if they make a choice, since they know what files are there, then they want to actually do a read or write operation, the data that backs up those files that we have metadata for can be fetched lazily or on demand. And so this is absolutely critical for enabling uh, scenarios where remote clients distributed around the globe can start consuming the data as fast as possible. They don't have to wait for the data to get transferred. They have all the information they need to start making decisions about what data to interact with, and then they can lazily populate the data chunks. Uh, you know, EdgeFS also does uh, global deduplication as well. So I was saying that all the blocks have unique identities, and when you modify a block, it gets a whole brand new identity. So this enables you to do deduplication of if you have identical data chunks, you can, um, you can take multiple of them and only just store it once or you know, however many times you want to according to replication that you want to achieve. But you don't have to continue having you know, tons and tons of copies of highly popular data. You can constrain that down, have less copies of them, and do less work. Uh, disaster recovery is kind of a built-in philosophy of EdgeFS's globally uh, distributed data system where if you lose a data chunk on one particular cluster, you can just repopulate it from another, uh, another particular segment there. So your local caches, your local segments, your sites will always be populated with uh, the data that may have been lost locally. So CockroachDB, Rook does control plan orchestration services for CockroachDB as well. And Cockroach also happens to be natively designed for global storage. So um, one interesting aspect of Cockroach's architecture, though, is that it has this built-in locality awareness. So um, you know, with Cockroach, you're not necessarily bound to the data centers of a single cloud provider. Uh, it's an absolute design goal from the very beginning in CockroachDB to, to two steps here. One is to minimize latency, so to be able to, when you're, uh, you're locality aware, you can make decisions about where to put the data to be closer to the users that are actually going to use that data and care about that data. But you can also, as a secondary or a complementary design goal, you can uh, avoid sacrificing availability. Let's, let's say you know, your users are going to be accessing the data in, in uh, New York, let's say. And so to really uh, minimize the latency there, you could put it all in New York. But that would be sacrificing availability. If New York happens to have a, um, a disaster, then you've lost all, you put all your eggs in that basket and you've lost them, right? So you want to minimize latency, but also don't sacrifice availability. You want to have a high number of copies somewhere else, though, in case you lose some in the primary zone. Um, CockroachDB has, uses two different distributed algorithms to do its magic across its globally distributed storage system. 
uh, the, there's uh, the gossip protocol and the raft consensus algorithm. So for the gossip protocol, that's what the nodes use to self-organize, to talk to each other, find out where they are, how much storage capacity they have, um, you know, where the data on them resides, all that sort of stuff. And then raft consensus is basically a means that they use to all agree upon what replicas exist on them and what state they should be in. So etcd, you know, which is the backing persistent storage for uh, the Kubernetes API server, does the exact same thing. It uses the same raft consensus algorithm to make sure that everyone agrees. And if somebody doesn't agree about the state of the data, it's a specific algorithm to drive to consensus and make sure that all the data is in a highly consistent state across the entire globe. So just to give you an example, of uh, how Cockroach does, um, deals with locality is that when you start up a Cockroach instance, you're actually informing it about its locality information. So you can tell it that it's in a particular region, a particular uh, zone, or a data center, or even a rack, or you know, what machine, whatever. You can tell Cockroach where uh, it resides so that it has this locality awareness and it can make decisions and smart, informed decisions about how to move in, uh, data around in the system. So the whole goal here of having this locality information is to increase replica diversity is what it's called. And replica diversity means that you, uh, the copies of the data you have you want them to be spread out across the machines that are in different localities. So you could have a replica count of, let's say, three or five on three or five different machines, but if they're all in the same uh, area, they have the same locality, that's not, you're not really doing anything good for, um, for durability and availability of your system. So increasing replica diversity is a very important goal of Cockroach's locality awareness. Uh, when there is a failure, though, Cockroach can, can temporarily sacrifice uh, replica diversity in favor of replica count. So say that we have um, you know, a number of different uh, copies of the data spread across a certain number of uh, regions, and then we lose one. Um, you know, instead of just saying, OK, I can't get the replica diversity I want, so I won't do anything, it's better to make multiple copies within you know, a smaller amount of regions, it's just that we still have some redundancy in the system. And then once that uh, region that failed comes back up, we can spread the data out again, increase the replica diversity, and improve our availability and our durability. Um, yes? Uh, you could be hold questions to the end, if you mind. OK, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, so the um, one I think was something that's really interesting about uh, Cockroach is that this replication constraints you set it gives you the ability to, um, to put this, uh, this locality awareness on at different levels of the system. So we can have a, you know, at the database level, you can have it, sorry, the cluster level, database level, table level, even down to the row, you can input uh, you know, constraints and drive the data in that system to be put into or forced into particular regions. So you can kind of have very much uh, tight control over how you want the global data layout of the cockroach system down to individual rows. Uh, the rows one, I believe, is an enterprise-only feature, but I still think it's a very impressive part of their architecture. OK, so let's move on to control plane approaches. So all that time, we were talking about the data planes, right? So now we want to talk about the control plane, the system that organizes and orchestrates and manages uh, all the data plane uh, instances and nodes. So let's, uh, we, if we remember, that Rook is a storage orchestrator, right? And so it provides orchestration and control plane services at the level of just a single cluster. Um, so if we want to do things at a global scale, then we're going to need um, something that's more of a global orchestrator that spans across clusters, across clouds, and enable actually global scenarios, right? And automated scenarios, at least. So this, uh, this global orchestrator, it could do things like deploy all of the necessary components for a global data plane like EdgeFS. It could set up all of those EdgeFS instances, those ISGW instances, to link all the segments together. Um, it could do uh, automated setup of mirroring and replication features for something that, like Ceph that is a local cluster-only architecture. Um, but if you have an orchestrator that spans across all these, uh, all these instances or all these clouds and clusters, then you can start making those smart decisions about how you want that, the data planes to be set up so that they're ready for global scale and global distribution. 
so yeah, you know, a global control plane um, would be would it would be the control plane for global storage systems. Um, and it would be able to do even more than just setting up and having awareness of locality and making these decisions about where the data should live. It could actually do even more interesting stuff that you'd want an operator to do. It could you know, orchestrate um, rebalancing of data across the global scale. It could automate some disaster recovery scenarios or failover scenarios. Um, you, know, you could do all these sort of smart things when you have this setup here. Uh, to be able to span all these clouds and create these uh, globally distributed data planes. So a critical piece of the infrastructure that this type of global storage uh, orchestrator or control plane would need is a multi-cluster or multi-cloud control plane. And so there's a couple examples of that. One of them here is KubeFed, which is, I believe, the new name for the Federation V2 effort. And so you know, the, this is a control plane in Kubernetes that spans across multiple Kubernetes clusters. And so there's three key parts of its architecture here, uh, the templates, placement, and overrides. Uh, so templates is how you represent a set of resources that are going to be common across all of the clusters that you have uh, in this federated scenario. Placement is information you give about where do you want this resource to be placed across these clusters. Do you want it in cluster one, cluster two? Um, you know, decisions about where the resources will get uh, put to. And then you have a set of overrides, which is kind of uh, like, you know, you have rules about putting this particular deployment in cluster one and cluster two, but you can override that with specific configuration for, you know, oh, in this cluster, do something a little bit different. So you put all these components or these concepts together, and you can start to be able to deploy and run services across many Kubernetes clusters. Uh, propagation refers to how, from this single control plane, do we make decisions and then make those resources actually show up in the other clusters? We've got to propagate these placement and scheduling decisions to other clusters so that our target clusters are actually running the services that we want. Now, another um, you know, global orchestrator, multi-cloud orchestrator, uh, is a, cro the, a project called Crossplane that uh, we've, we started and open source just before KubeCon in Seattle, uh, so about five months ago. And so Crossplane, is uh, it, it also extends Kubernetes and uh, to be able to, very similar uh, to what we saw with KubeFed, to be able to have a single control plane that will span across multiple clouds and clusters. Um, but then, you know, instead of just Kubernetes resources, it would be able to also deploy infrastructure, um, our applications, our platform services, et cetera, and make smart decisions about how to globally optimize these placements, how we could actually put our services and distribute them and propagate them across all of our different uh, clouds and clusters that we are spanning. Um, and in addition to that, you know, a portable set of resource abstractions, so you know, the concept of a Postgres database or a MySQL database, um, you know, have a portable set of resources that can easily be able to deploy all sorts of services and infrastructure, et cetera, across all these different clouds and, uh, and clusters. Okay, so let's get here towards uh, a demo here. And this is a bit of a busy slide, and there's a picture on the next slide that, that it, it gives you a visualization for this, so it'll kind of make that a little bit easier. So uh, we're, what we're going to do here is we're going to show uh, you know, Rook using the EdgeFS. So Rook as a control plane, using EdgeFS as the data plane to enable a globally scaled, global, globally distributed scenario. So what I've set up here is uh, a couple of EKS clusters in different regions, so they're globally distributed. And then Rook does the work in the single clusters, uh, the orchestration work in the single clusters to bring up and bootstrap and configure e uh, EdgeFS clusters in those EKS clusters. And then each one of those EdgeFS clusters also exposes an S3 service. And then in between those EdgeFS clusters, we've got uh, an intersegment gateway link that connects them. This is the connection or the link that we need between our different global, or, or excuse me, our different local segments to make a global segment. Uh, and a quick note too that, uh, that we're doing this with an Amazon scenario, but also Google Cloud is actually also supported by EdgeFS, and Azure work is in progress. So at the end of that, you'd be able to stitch all of the cloud providers together into a single geographic namespace. So here's the picture, as promised. I'm not an artist, but it does definitely represent what I'm talking about better than that. So what we're going to see here is on the left side of the diagram, we're going to take a file or an object, and we're going to do a put to an S3 bucket. 
And then I have that connected to Lambda uh, to subscribe to bucket events that will then just propagate or copy that over to our, one of our EdgeFS clusters that exposes an S3 interface. Uh, and then we have another EdgeFS cluster, one in the east region and one in the west region, that is connected by this intersegment gateway here that then binds those two clusters together to be able to stitch together two segments into a globally distributed namespace. So this is the pretty picture here, or picture, let's not use the pretty word. And now let's do a demo. Uh, so before I start this demo, I wanted to give a thanks to uh, Dimitri uh, and Ilya from the HFS team. They definitely gave me a lot of help to get this set up and understand all the concepts. So I um, wanted to make sure that they were included in this. All right. So here I have a, a prompt, and uh, before, you may have seen me walking back and forth in the room here to try to make the fonts big enough to read in the back. I also was wearing my glasses, so that might not, not have been a good test. But I think it should be big enough. This is not supposed to be big enough. This is just my cheat sheet here, because I'm really bad at typing and talking at the same time. All right, uh, and I know that the lights at the top of the screen are a little bit bright, and we can't dim those. But basically what I'm showing here is that on my laptop, my little uh, MacBook here, uh, I have a couple of different Kubernetes contexts set up so that I'm pointing at two entirely different Kubernetes clusters, one in the west region and one in the east region, uh, and they're both running uh, EdgeFS. So, okay, so we've got two different Kubernetes clusters set up, and let's first look at the east one. And so I'm using Kube Control to connect to the east cluster, and I'm looking at what's running there in the EdgeFS namespaces. So we have an EdgeFS operator running, the Rook EdgeFS operator running, and then we've got a number of services uh, like the S3 service, the ISGW service, um, the EdgeFS manager. So we have that set up in that cluster, and then we have a very s familiar or very similar scenario set up in the west region. So I'm just switching my Kube Control to point to the west region, and I'm getting the pods, and we see the same Rook EdgeFS operator and the same you know, ISGW and S3 pods running as well. OK, and then now last thing to get started here is let's use the S3 CMD to look at what's currently in the buckets. So right now, uh, on the east bucket, the global bucket, I've got nothing. And on the west bucket, I got nothing. So there's nothing in my buckets. So let's take a look here at S3. And so now we're going to go ahead and upload a file to S3. I'm going to pick this uh, little pixel picture here. And I'm going to accept all the defaults and upload that file. And good, conference Wi-Fi is working, thank goodness. And uh, so I have uploaded a file into the S3 bucket. And so if you remember, When I put that file into the S3 bucket, a Lambda function is uh, executed in response to the bucket create and bucket remove events that then propagates that uh, object over to the S3 service that EdgeFS is running inside of a cluster. And then the ISGW uh, link connects the two disparate uh, geographically distributed clusters to copy the data over. So what we should see now, um, after all that kicked in, is that on both the, on the east cluster, we should see that same little pixel jared.jpg uh, jpeg uh, file. And then we should also see the exact same thing on the west, uh, <laughs> We should eventually see the, the uh, file on the west cluster as well. Uh, I was talking to Dimitri and Ilya about the architecture of EdgeFS, and there's uh, the by default, one of the optimizations that they do is to have a delay in the propagation in order to be able to batch up uh, oper uh, files and objects that you want to co copy across. So um, let's see if it's going through now. Cool. So it is on the west side now. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, and so I, I think that that's a configurable, tunable parameter if you can turn that delay off completely. Um, but I left the defaults on there, so it uh, tries to get as many files as it can and with a delay and then batch them all up and send them over the wire in one big bundle instead of opening and closing connections over and over. So that's a by design. And I don't, I'm not even lying about that. That's the best part about it. OK, so then uh, I'm just doing a CD over to my desktop, and then I'm going to use the S3CMD command to uh, do a git operation 
on the, from the West cluster to go ahead and download the, um, that little file that we first started in uh, S3, then went to our, one of our EdgeFS clusters, and then over to our other EdgeFS cluster. So on my desktop, we should see that the file is back, and we, it's a little pixel file of this mug here. Um, so it's not a very important file or anything like that. But it has gone the full round trip from on my laptop, uploaded to S3, through Lambda to EdgeFS cluster 1 in the East region, and then across with ISGW to the uh, EdgeFS cluster orchestrated by Rook in the West region, and then downloaded back to my laptop. Um, so that's, uh, you can imagine useful scenarios instead of uploading a pixelated picture of my face, but uh, the, the data, this globally distributed cluster across multiple regions and multiple areas of the globe stitched together with storage orchestration services uh, for availability, reliability, et cetera, is basically a reality now. So. Uh, Rook and uh, the Crossplane project that I mentioned to, uh, you know, I'm a maintainer on both of those. They are open source projects. Uh, Rook is a CNCF project. And, um, you know, they're both community driven. Uh, the communities are both growing for both of them. Um, you're active on Slack, active on GitHub, happy to have new users, um, file issues, test out the, the services, um, even contributors as well. The Rook project has more than 150 contributors now. Um, so, you know, let's, let's keep growing it and keep building cool stuff like this. Um, and the last thing is that there are more sessions about Rook here at KubeCon. Well, I'm not in presentation mode. How can you look at slides if it's not full screen? So we have some more Rook sessions here. Um, you will notice that the deep dive into Rook is uh, this very same day in 15 minutes. And so I was the lucky recipient of a scheduling decision by the KubeCon committee to do back-to-back -back talks. So I actually have to shut down my laptop, run over to G3, wherever that is, and we will be showing up some more stuff in Rook in just a few minutes. And then right after that, the CNCF has a booth in the um, sponsor showcase there that they're calling the answer bar now. And it's sort of like a meet the maintainer session where the Rook maintainer, project maintainers, will be there to be able to answer questions and talk about more stuff. So while we don't have much time for questions right now, there will be uh, the opportunity to go check out the deep dive right now and to also um, meet the rest of the maintainer team uh, at the CNCF answer bar. And later on, there's more Rook talks today, too. So that's four things about Rook. If you didn't get Rook enough right now, four more. So thank you very much. I appreciate it, guys.